welcome everyone. I think we're going to have a, uh, a very lively conversation today about um, lessons from the Southwest Airlines fiasco. We're going to be speaking about uh, technical debt and internal customers, um, things that are on a lot of folks' minds right now, I believe. So we have uh, two panelists joining us today here at 280 Group. We have Joe Galley and Elad Sim Simone, I believe. Um, why don't you uh, both just take a moment to introduce yourselves? Hey everyone, my name is Joe Galley. I'm a principal consultant and chairman of 280 Group. I'm calling in from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I've been in the product management space for 20 years and I'm really excited to be part of this opportunity. Hi everybody. Yeah. I'm Hi everyone, I'm Elad Simon. I'm the CEO of Craft.io. Um, been in the product management space and the management space for about 15 years or so, and uh, excited to be here as well and talk about technical debt. And also, as you can see, my beard is a little bit trimmer. I've decided to uh, to work to work on that as, as a preparation for the webinar. All right, uh, I'm Robin Brooks, uh, Director of Product Management here at 280 Group, and uh, excited to be your host for today. All right. So at 280 Group, we offer full circle product management and product marketing solutions. Um, and uh, we are excited to host today. Just a little bit more about us. We offer training and workshops, team and individual coaching, uh, product lifecycle templates, strategic consulting, uh, foundational training and certifications, um, all centered around our optimal product process methodology. Um, if you're interested in learning more about us, there'll be a link in the chat. And uh, just a little bit about Craft.io. Eli, do you want to speak to this just for a moment? Yeah, sure. So thanks for that, Robin. Um, um, so Craft.io is a product management platform uh, which empowers product teams to build great products with confidence. We are uh, excited to, uh, to be here today and hopefully, uh, and hopefully uh, interest you with uh, the, talking about technical debt and uh, internal customers. Great. All right, and we are eager to hear your questions as soon as we can get that working, hopefully any minute now. And also the main question we always get is, can you watch this later? We understand everyone is busy. Um, yes, you will receive a link if some of your colleagues weren't able to join us live. Um, and uh, yeah, we're looking forward to circulating this after the session is over. And with that, why don't we, uh, why don't we jump in and I will hand it over to you, Joe. Yeah, hey everyone. Uh, I think some of you may have seen my my, my blog post. If you hadn't, we'll we'll follow up. Uh, so I was one of the many one of the many that were stranded uh, over the holidays, uh, taking a flight back from from Providence, Rhode Island to Milwaukee. And you know, on the drive back, it made me think about you know some lessons we can gain from uh, what happened with Southwest Airlines over the holidays. You know, in terms of really understanding, you know, what what can we what can we leverage, or what can we how can we be better as product professionals? And you know, when we look at Southwest, I don't want to dive into the details. You know, there were there were really two things that really stuck out to me as a product leader, and one of them was, hey, you know, their infrastructure could not handle uh, what was happening during that time of the year with the bad weather, with the holidays, the increase in demand. We had many. Um, flight attendants and, and pilots calling in sick. So their system just couldn't handle uh, what happened. And as a, as a result, they had to shut down for a couple of days and reset. Uh, so crazy as it was, uh, it was inspirational for me. And I'm really excited for this uh, opportunity because we're going to cover two big topics. One is around, you know, how do you manage technical debt? And the other one is around, you know, how to understand your uh, internal customers. All right, and it looks like the Q and A works, or the chat and, works, and and the chat works. Everything and works. The chat. So yeah. I think I think we're set. So thank you for, from the folks behind the scenes that are, that are helping us out. No, that is not thank me you. with the backpack, but that could have easily been me uh, over the holidays. <laughs> All right, the next slide. All right, so so tech debt, right? What is it? Uh, you know, it, it has a bad name. You know, I was thinking about this today, and I'm like, gosh, I wonder what would happen if we gave it a more friendly name. I know in my previous experiences, I've used the term product life cycle, but for those who are newer to this concept, you know, mm -hmm. tech debt, as the slide says, it's the interest you pay to keep your technology current. Uh, it's something that just isn't avoidable, right? It's always growing. It's, think of it like uh, buying 
an item on a credit card, there's always interest that's accumulating. Mm -hmm. And so much like, you know, uh, making sure you stay current with your credit card bill or making sure you stay current with visiting the dentist or the doctor, you, it requires ongoing, a uh, little bit of tender loving care, right? There's constant refactoring. Um, it's not exactly the glitziest work for any mm -hmm. engineer, but if you manage it from a, from a, uh, from a budget perspective, it can definitely be manageable because ultimately, you know, when I try to work with leaders and different organizations in our workshops and our classes, it should never be an either or discussion. It should be an and. I want to do the big, new, and shiny, and I want to be able to pay down our tech debt. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to kick off with our first poll question. And we want to know, you know, from the audience, how do you handle tech debt? Okay, the poll should be active. It is. Excellent. And this is just as a reminder, as we're doing the poll question, we wanna take your questions throughout the webinar. So please, we have Robin on the call here. She's gonna help keep uh, Elad and I as honest as possible with all your great questions. Okay. Drum rolls. Results, Results are in. Are, Results are in. Are in, and uh, it's a it's a really interesting split. So let me share these results so everyone can see. And uh, yeah, so it looks like nearly half allocate capacity during roadmap and planning, at least some capacity, which is great. Uh, many uh, about 17% allocate that capacity during sprint execution. So kind of having a rolling list, it sounds like, and then 29% uh, deal with it as it arises and take a velocity hit. And I think that's fairly common. Um, and I love the 7% who were honest <laughs> enough to say they ignore the it for as long as possible. <laughs> there are much, there's many more than 7%. They're, they're, just, they're not they're alone. Just, <laughs> they're, just a, they're just a brave 7%, that's all. <laughs> that, that's, that's the 7% bravest folks, I think, on the call. So. So kudos to you. So Robin, why don't you go ahead and kick us off with some of the questions? I know we had some right. coming up during the call. Yeah, we we do have uh, we do have a few coming in. So uh, let's take a look here. Um, Okay, so uh, what is the uh, the right percentage of a sprint? to allocate to tech debt? Uh, that is Elon, the only question, start. right? <laughs> Elon, I'll let you start off that one. Sure, sure. That's uh, I, I think like 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 I think like many answers we're gonna we're gonna answer in this uh, specific thing about tech debt. The, the short answer is gonna be it depends. Um, and I really think it depends on the maturity of the product and where you guys are um, from a, a debt perspective. I think mm -hmm. in a lot of companies, especially when you start a new product, um, things are not as, um, let's say, as uh, uh, like tech, tech, tech that is not as prevalent or not as dramatic as, uh, as one uh, as you will see in more mature product. So I don't think there's like a, a magic number. I mean, you know, the, the number I have stuck in my head, but really is just a random number. Honestly, it's like anywhere between like, you know, 15 to 15 to 30 percent. Like for me, that's mm -hmm. like a that's like a, a, a ballpark number of what you would put in for, you know, anything to do with like bugs and as like ongoing technical debt, uh, the technical debt work. But, you know, if you're in a company that, you know, its stack is super old um, and if you don't do refactoring, um, you know, you're going to get stuck in the mud and you will not be able to change anything and you're not going to be able to do any progression because you're stuck from it from a from a debt perspective then it might take 80 percent of your sprint and you know on the on the flip side of it if you are um in a company you know if you just started a new product from scratch you know in the latest and greatest you know front end and back end technologies uh, etc you might not have any so it really is Kind of like, unfortunately, it depends. Kind of thing, uh, at least from my from my side perspective. With a, again, as a ballpark, uh, as a ballpark, I would say uh, anywhere between 15, 15 and thirty percent would be 
a common response you hear rather than the right answer for you specifically whoever asked that question i don't know um I, oh. I have a little so it sounds like you need to do a little bit of, uh, of internal um, uh, discussion around where your product is in the product life cycle, like Joe mentioned, right? And determine kind of what is the interest rate on your technical debt? <laughs> yeah. um, so you make sure that you're that you're paying it down. Um, I, uh, I'm curious, go ahead. No, no, go, go. Yeah. No. So uh, a couple of folks are interested in knowing what, uh, how do you convince your leadership to invest velocity in paying down technical debt, because that sounds like something that uh, that some folks struggle with. Uh, I know we've all experienced, you know, having to make the case for, um, especially if you want to pay down some of it, use a larger number uh, amount of velocity to uh, to actually pay down some of that technical debt so you can lower your interest rate. Yeah, I'll take that one. So, you know, we have to put ourselves in the shoes of our stakeholders and, and realize when they're questioning us, mm -hmm. they're not doing it out of spite. They're doing it because probably there's a, there's a strategy that they're, they're being held accountable for. And so, um, you know, if we get pushed back, we have, to, we have to almost empathize with our stakeholders like we empathize with our users and our customers. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on. So what I've seen work well for me in the past is you know, as we are in that planning process, as we begin to figure out what our plan is or how we're going to solve for a particular problem, I've always found it helpful to bring your stakeholders and your leaders along with you in the journey. You know, help them understand how, you know, a shortcut today will have an impact in the future in terms of, hey, yes, we may make some shortcuts and, and, and you know, hack to get to a certain delivery. But then on the back end of that, that means in three to five months or six months, we're going to have to fix it. Mm -hmm. So the more that we can be transparent, build trust, and really explain the impact, you know, um, you know, Southwest isn't the only company that's ever suffered mm -hmm. from paying, you know, from not paying attention to their tech debt. There are hundreds mm -hmm. of companies that we deal with on a daily basis. We just probably don't realize it. So the more you can be transparent the more you can bring them along in the journey. Um, you know, there are definitely articles out there that talk about the impact. Uh, I, I think those are some of the best techniques, at least from my perspective. Eli, anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, the topic of like, let's say positioning technical debt in the company and helping people understand why it's important is really is like, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating topic because it's a little bit like going to the gym it's like, mm -hmm. it's the thing that, you know, we all know conceptually it's right and we should do it. And it like, you know, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's good for us. <laughs> but, you know, if you look at the humanity on average, I guess, you know, a lot of people don't go to, end up not going to the gym. And, and it's because of that kind of like, um, our, there is a very clear tendency for, for all of us to, uh, to uh, prioritize short-term gains over long-term gains, right? So and there, that's really kind of one of, those, one of those big issues with technical debt, because it's not always imminent. I mean, in the case of Southwest, it became very imminent, right? So everything broke down. Mm -hmm. But in many cases, when you look at technical debt, actually, you know, sometimes there is a healthy balance, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, it's not like you always have to overinvest in it or you over. And this is why I think yeah. from, a, I mean, to, to, to Joe's point, absolutely taking, taking the, the, the leadership and the executive team through the journey um, of explaining you know, if we don't invest, you know, a healthy portion and wh whatever that number may be, that, you know, it could be the 10% or the 15 or the 20 or the 30. If we don't invest a healthy portion of that on, on an ongoing basis, um, there's going to be a moment in time where we're going to have no progression or extremely, extremely frustrating progression. What do you want to do? Do you prefer <laughs> this model or do you prefer that model? And, and by the way, it is eventually a choice. Like everything else, it is eventually mm -hmm. a choice. You can also decide, you know, you ignore it for a bit and then you overcome it. And, you know, there's like, you know, you can do this on an ongoing basis. You can do this in peaks and troughs. It really is like at the, at the hands of the, in my mind, eventually at the hands of the leadership. There's not like one recipe that fits all. Sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm a CEO of a growing startup and sometimes you have to do progression because if you don't do progression, then, you know, you might not get your next customer in. You know, and that's and that might be tactically right and strategically wrong from a tech debt perspective, but you know that's the thing you have to do right now. And so, the, 
this is really one thing and, and really to Joe's point, really mm -hmm. something you have to bring the balance to the leadership team to say, hey, th these are the options. These are the alternatives. Mm -hmm. I think ignoring tech that tech that, you know, and, and you know, the bravest we, we spoke about <laughs> in our poll, <laughs> ignoring it completely is something that, uh, you know, I, I just wouldn't do, uh, you know, wholeheartedly because it, 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 eventually it will bite you. It's just a question of when, but eventually it's going to it's going to bite you. I mean, I was in a company at some point that any any feature progression, like anything, literally anything, if you want to add a column into a into a table view, that would take three months to, to do. Like anything would take like three months of development. And it was, mm -hmm. it was because the technical that was so big and it was, you know, the, the system was so old that, you know, it was just, it just couldn't handle any more changes. And so, you know, and that's really kind of like the, the, the place you really don't want to get into, but absolutely take people through the journey. And to Joe's, again, to, to the point you mentioned earlier, using stories like Southwest and others, by the way, the, Southwest is really an extreme version of, you know, you know, like a, a big kerfuffle that happens because of technical debt. But there's a lot of there's a lot of other, you know, mini horror stories that you can also share with management, not to necessarily, you know, terrorize them into decision making, but really into um, kind of understanding the implications in, in a in a more storytelling way, not just in terms of like, you know, this is the right thing to do. Sometimes that's sure. sometimes that's a motivator. There was another really good question uh, that I think kind of speaks to this overall category that we're talking about around technical debt. Um, you know, that how do you differentiate between, uh, you know, what is considered traditional technical debt, you know, the things that need to be in, invested in the, uh, uh, the product itself versus infrastructure, right, or architectural debt, um, as, uh, as some call it. Uh, is that all the same category and are they related? And then how do you differentiate when you're diagnosing the sale failure has happened like it did to Southwest? How do you dis determine whether it was, you know, technical debt on the product or, uh, you know, related to the infrastructure that hasn't scaled correctly? I mean, I, to me, they're one and the same. Mm -hmm. right? It's the foundation. It's like, if you think about your home, you have your plumbing and your electrical, right? You have to, if you want to add the man cave, you first have to upgrade the electrical or maybe even the plumbing, right? They're, they they work, they work in tandem with each other. So in the case of Southwest, uh, and, and they, and, and I know this because I worked with them many years ago, they were frugal with their mm -hmm. platform. You know, they, you know, to their credit, their focus was on providing value. They were a low cost carrier. You know, they were penny pinchers. You know, Herb Keller was a genius. Um, but as we sometimes forget, they also acquired Airtran. Um, they, they acquired Airtran because they wanted their technology because they knew their technology was getting antiquated. And so, you know, where a lot of organizations sometimes struggle is in, even in those mergers and acquisitions is, you know, you're trying to figure out how to get these two systems together, or you're trying to figure out how to retire an older system. And I think, you know, in the case of Southwest, you know, they forego, uh, you know, they looked at the new and shiny and what they didn't do, they didn't keep their infrastructure current. It could be the code base, it could be the security patches, it could just be the technology. You know, when I worked in front tech, uh, we used a, a, a solution called Bootstrap to build a responsive web we had to upgrade from bootstrap 4.0 to 6.0, right? There was inherent risks to the business. If we didn't, there were vulnerabilities. And so technical, technical debt is more of a umbrella term, whether it's on the, the front end side or even on the back end side. Yeah. And, and to add to that, Joe, and I, one, I, I completely agree with you. And to add to that, I, I, it, for me, that question almost indicates like, like, um, different responsibilities. And that's what I'm really worried about. Like that, like that's where this mindset really worries me in the, in the sense that you can think of technical debt on the product side and then technical debt on the R&D or development side where it's like more architectural. But the reality is that eventually, the um, unless there's a really big architect, like uh, unless there's a big, really big infrastructure team that does completely, it works completely separately from development, but even in that case, product, and this is why why we're having this conversation, you know, with product folks. Product eventually needs to look at the big picture and say, like, these are all eventually risks that can like drag me down, slow me, slow me down, prevent me, prevent me from progression, and sometimes you know bring bring to my de demise or collapse. And so it doesn't really matter. Is 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 that because I didn't upgrade to the latest technology on the front end? 
or backend, or is that because um, you know I haven't I haven't thought through my you know my, my feature set as of yet? It's really not about um, this is the responsibility of this team and this is the responsibility of that team. Technical debt really is this umbrella kind of concept, and I, I actually I like the term because I mean it resonates well with me the concept of, of debt because it's like it's one of those things that you have to take care of. It's not like debt is something that you really have to take care of rather than you're just going to, you know, you know, if you, if you ignore debt for too long, eventually you're going to be in trouble kind of thing. And, and I think that's where the analogy kind of works. And so I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't separate those two um, into like, you know, different things. Yeah. Yeah. There was a, a question in the chat, Robin, I saw it, you know, in terms of um, how do we establish that this the problem is technical debt? I can go a little bit deeper on this just briefly. So, uh, so basically there's scheduling systems. Right. This is where they were trying to figure out where to place pilots and the, um, the flight attendants. Their scheduling system wasn't on an older platform, like it hadn't been updated. Right. It was, you know, behind the scenes, it was working, but it, it couldn't handle the, the size of all the changes that were happening at once. You know, I, I, I know it's the, um, I mean, it, the term gets used a lot, but the perfect storm. But, you know, when you look at the weather changes, you know, flight crew being out. Uh, and then, um, you know, their, their system, you know, all those things happening at once, it couldn't handle it. So when we talk about, you know, the root cause, I don't want to say, you know, and this is not fair of me to even say this, it's not the only reason, but it's a contributing cause to what happened to them over the holidays, right? We're going to, we're going to go into the internal customer piece of it, but this was not anything, no, no one that was an employee at Southwest was frankly surprised by this because they knew that their system was older, right? Many of us have worked in organizations where we're coming in and we're like, goodness gracious, this is, you know, was this built during DOS? You know, was this Windows 3.0? I mean, many of us still work at companies where the technology just hasn't been updated because you've been able, you've been able to skate by. So that was one of the causes to what happened to Southwest. Yeah, uh, so this is, seems like a good segue to start talking about internal customers and how Southwest, um, even when they were investing in their platform and their technology and their products to keep them up to date, their focus was more on their, their external paying customers than their internal customers. Um, so it seems like a good time to, to transition into that conversation because that definitely weighs when you're trying to talk to leadership about where to invest. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, we talk about internal customers. Let's Let's first kind of level set a little bit this is customer service customer service mm -hmm. are your, your representatives they are your front line they're your internal customers it could be people in accounting people in finance your sales team anyone that you enable them the ability to deliver value to your external customers those are your internal customers and as the slide says they are extremely critical to your success right because their ability to delight and serve your customers, your paying customers, is really predicated on your ability to make their life easier, right? Uh, how quickly can they get back to that user? How quickly can the user complete their task or get help is really predicated on the internal customers. And I think, again, just based off of what I've read, you know, this type of feedback has been, had been given to Southwest upper management for many years. The system was slow. They were, they were doing some, um, some items behind the scene to try to get by, but Ultimately, this was feedback that was ignored for a long time, and they they paid the price for it uh, over the holidays. Yeah, and, and and by the way, Joe, and for me, that's really a, one. It's a good segue, but it really is like um, not not the same as technical. It's related, of course, you know, and that's why we kind of bundled this this together uh, when we talked about this uh, the Southwest issue. It's related, but it's not specifically tech. Like you know, the, the issue of the internal customer is not just about tech debt. It really is. It's on its own a thing. Um, and and you know, and while we can of course connect connect the two dots together, um, there's something about that internal customer. And I, I guess um, that's kind of like while we're talking about that, there's something about this inter internal customer that is almost by. Um, um, definition or like almost always, at least in a lot of the companies I see is kind of neglected, right? So left aside or like, you know, that's not, that's not the priority. And so, you know, I, I'd love to talk a little bit about, about, about that. I don't know if we have questions about that or we can, I can just like jump in into it, but you know, that's a, 
for me, that's one of the things that is really fascinating about, about the internal customer um, problem. I don't know if we have any more slides on this, but... Um... I think that's the only slide. Cool. So All Robbie, right, let me, uh, let me launch the poll here. We've got yeah. another question. So how do you prioritize your internal customer work uh, at your organization, whether it's your direct responsibility or not? Um, how, uh, how, do you, how do you prioritize internal customers versus, uh, versus external customers? All right. Let's see what we got. All right. So we have about 60% allocate that capacity during roadmap and planning, about 10% who do it during sprint execution, about 23% who deal with it as it arises, and another brave 7% saying they ignore their internal customers for as long as possible. I'm really glad we have some honest folks on the uh, on the webinar today. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder if it's the same people. <laughs> we, ignore both, <laughs> we ignore both the, you know. You know, we're just like we're just gonna do progression and we'll just see how it goes. So another good question in chat is how do you how do you design a product process that handles this really well? How do you prioritize in, uh, you know technical debt? How do you empathize with internal customers like you do with external customers and reserve the and allocate the right amount of capacity to paying attention to each of these things? while balancing the velocity that the business expects to achieve uh, the, the business outcomes. You like to take this one? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start. I'll start if it's okay. So I think, by the way, uh, you, this is a really interesting point about priority, basically about prioritization and how do you prioritize mm -hmm. and how do you prioritize, I mean, technical debt and of course, the internal customer as part of, as part of this process. Um, the way I saw it happening, and you know, there's a lot of prioritization methodologies out there in, in, in the world, right? So, you know, if there's a Levice or ICE or Wischief or, or Moscow or, you know, there's, there's, quite, a, there's quite a lot of them. Um, the one thing I would say is that um, I, would, I would at least have like one of, the, one of the prioritization, let's say, permutations around kind of buckets. And I like the buckets kind of concept um, because I really believe that that really helps um, at least float if there are any gaps that you are willing or not willing to live with, right? And what I mean by that, what I mean by the buckets concept, like, for example, imagine you break down, and this is something I, I saw in an article uh, on, on Reforge recently, like, if you, if you, if you break down an article, if you take an article, if you, sorry, if you take a, your work and you break it down to four buckets, um, one is like feature work, one is like a growth work, one is, um, one is around um, like scale or technical debt, and one is around uh, like, you know, like things that, you know, help you with like catching up with competition, et cetera. If you have those buckets and then you break down your work to those buckets, you are then able to, um, you're able to visualize to the people who are, who are you know, responsible for decision-making, are, you know, are you taking anything, are you doing anything on this, 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 or that, right? So because the, the challenge with a lot of the prioritization methodologies I've seen in the past is that, you know, if you look at it line by line perspective, you know, sometimes, you know, in many cases, the progression kind of features always win, you know, the, like the new shiny features, they might always win on any type of uh, prioritization methodology you do, because in many cases, they, you know, they'll get a lot of, you know, kind of perceived value because people always are optimistic about, you know, how much value this feature is going to bring in the future and all that kind of stuff. But when you use the bucket methodology, then you're saying, hey, I know that I'm not neglecting anything, you know? So that's like, I think for me, that's like a really nice approach to do that. Um, an alternative, by the way, and, and again, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, Joe. The, an alternative is to also embed within your prioritization framework, always embed things like risk, like risk management um, as, par as, part of your, as part of your priorities. So that uh, if something is, an, uh, you know, poses a potential inherent risk, it gets bumped up in the score. Because, 
in a lot of cases, if you just do the simple, you know, must have, should have, could have, won't have kind of prioritization, the internal customers are always going to be on the, you know, they're going to be on the on the bottom at the bottom of those at the bottom of the on the, the right hand side of those lists. I don't know, Joe, what you think. Yeah, no, no, uh, I I could not agree with you more. I mean, one that comes to mind again, you know, everyone has their own preference, but uh, the prioritization that method that comes to mind is WSGIF. Um, for those who aren't aware, it's a weighted shortest job first, and it it takes four criteria, and one of those criteria is something called risk reduction and opportunity enablement. And so what I, when I work with product leaders and product managers, I tell them that, hey, although this item that's tech debt may score low on business value, it will score much higher in that risk reduction or opportunity enablement, which is why I'm a big fan, press personally, just from my own experiences at you know, previous organizations, that's why I like having that particular method for prioritization. Now, the key is, and I think Eli would agree with me, prioritization is more art than science. You can't just take the number and say, well, this one is higher than the other one. You have to look at the strategic goals of the organization. You have to account for dependencies. So it's a little bit, it's, it's a little bit more complicated, but I, that's why I like incorporating that risk component into any prioritization method. Yeah, I, I agree, John. And I think that's kind of what I was kind of alluding to. That I think eventually prioritization needs to be needs to be done with multiple lenses. Yes. Right. So, like, if you just use a single lens, whichever lens is going to be, by the way, it's going to lend itself towards something. And and you see that in a lot of cases. And 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 of course, <laughs> we work with a lot of product teams here. And 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 it's. Obviously, it could be a very like nightmare kind of exercise to say, no, instead of just like adopting one methodology, you need to adopt multiple methodologies of prioritization to your organization. Right? That's like <laughs> agreeing on one with a group of product managers is always, it's, it's difficult enough kind of thing. But the reality is that if you don't do that, and if you don't actually slice, you know, kind of slice and dice the data in different lenses, you're going to miss out on things. You might end up doing things that are completely off your OKRs, for example, or yeah. you might, or you might completely neglect your internal customer, for example, right? So, and that's really kind of one of those things where um, um, having those multiple lenses is so critical for the success for the success of the product organization. And rather than just like having a very like single dimensional kind of approach to, to doing prioritization. The other thing I would say, and, and by the way, and, and I, we see, and, and, and Joe, you, you and I have been, you know, been, we know each other for quite some time and, and we've been seeing a lot of companies uh, jointly, I would say, and, uh, in some companies, you actually have people, dedicated teams to handle the internal customer, right? So exactly exactly for that reason, because I think there is an understanding, and I think probably Southwest got, got the balance somewhere wrong in, you know, in, in that sense. There is an understanding that uh, if you bundle it all into one team that does you know, both the consumer, let's say the consumer experience, as well as the business, internal business needs of the organization, in all likelihood, the shiny, cool, consumer, yep. glitzy stuff is going to get, even, even if you got all the prioritization methodologies right, eventually because it's glitzy, because senior management loves it, because it's the consumer, you know, like people are going to have a more affinity towards that. And that's why some, sometimes, again, I'm not saying it's always right for every company, but sometimes the right thing to do is to actually segregate a team dedicated for this thing otherwise you know it, it might get neglected i don't know if you have any i mean i'm sure you've seen this thing. yeah you know it's so it's really interesting i'm, I'm actually teaching a uh, one of our public uh opm our, our our introduction to product management and you know as you're talking about this it made me think about and this is a question uh, a gentleman named sean in the in the chat asked this about you know stakeholders and their eagerness for profitability you got to start with the basics like i always tell uh product leaders you know, do you have a persona built for your internal customer? Do you have a customer journey map? You know, where in their journey to complete their work are they getting pain points? You know, where are they struggle? And then the, the key is is the uh, is to quantify it, right? Because I think when we look at profitability, this is where some stakeholders get tripped up, and even product leaders get tripped. They look at profitability only coming from the new shiny object that they have to build. When in reality, 
the, the, the profitability can come from saving money because your internal processes are more efficient. You're, ab you're able to get done more with fewer people. And in this economic climate, that's humongous. So we almost have to, to you know, shift the mindset away from profitability comes not just from coming up with a new idea, but that profitability can come from how can we take our internal processes and be more efficient at it? We can save time, we can save money, we can save headcount, and that's that's got a pretty big impact on the bottom line. And so to, to that question in the Q&A, that's how we have to think about it. But in order to get there, and again, going back to even the basics of product management, you need metrics, right? You need to understand how long does it take? So that way you can answer the question, how much time am I gonna save if I make that enhancement? I don't know, thoughts? Yeah, I think, by the way, Joe, on that point, um, and there's quite a lot of questions coming in, especially around the, I mean, Robin, correct me if I'm wrong here, like a lot about how to convince stakeholders. Like, it looks like that's like a yes. really, it's like, it's, it's, a, it's a bubbling up theme of like, a, so it, it looks like we're yeah, hitting it. I, I we're we're it. hitting I a nerve. The best, but how do I convince my leadership that the baseline that we have today is not going to stay there, right? Like, let's, let's keep building on top of it. But what is the risk? How do I how do I express the risk of doing nothing to our existing technologies and infrastructure and products um, while we uh, while we are attracted to that new shiny thing? Um, so yeah, any any additional insight on on how to have those conversations? What data to present? How do you how do you help them really understand that risk? So I, I I have a lot of thoughts about stakeholder stakeholder management in general. So I, I I am a I'm a it's a big it's a big topic in my mind, mm -hmm. and I think one of the things that a lot of product and a lot of product teams get um, I don't want to say wrong, but you know the, our challenge with is the notion of like data is going to win everything, and you know I'm I'm gonna yeah I might be I might be slapped you on the wrist for saying that in in a group full of product managers who love data and I and I'm I'm a, I, I love data myself just don't get me wrong. Um, but uh, in many cases, when you when you deal with uh, senior stakeholders, uh, data could be confusing for them. In some cases, they could be feeling that you know they've seen a lot of data, but you know it might not be as convincing. And so, I think the key thing, and this is like you know good old stakeholder management one hundred and one kind of thing, is to understand who your stakeholders are and what actually motivates them. And really, before you decide on a single-handed, you know, I have a one-size-fits-all way of convincing everybody in the world <laughs> that I'm right, and it's with data. Um, and there's a lot of people in the world who are uh, not as data-driven as the other, as others, and they might be more persuaded with stories, with anecdotes, with you know, potentially with horror stories, um, or with like you know actually taking them through the experience, right? So I, I know, for example, you know, Amazon does this thing. I, I don't know if it does it anymore, but it used to do this um, in the past, at least, that uh, you know, when you joined Amazon, you had to do, I think, a week or two weeks in customer, in customer service. It, like every employee in Amazon had to do that. I, I don't know if it's like still the same. And so and one of the things, one of the reasons I love that is because um, it provides people with the actual experience that their end users are feeling um, as part of, and, and so what I strongly recommend for the product team is to try to find ways to animate, let, let's say we're talking about the internal customer here, and you're trying to convince people to invest in the internal customer. Take them through the action, forget about the data for a moment, take them through the actual journey. In, in the case of Southwest, for example, of booking flight attendants and uh, like just show them so that they feel the pain and potentially even the shame <laughs> that they're, you know, they're leading a company whose processes are so messed up. And that might, and again, I'm not saying this is a, in, the, the wisdom of hindsight is not, you know, it's not brilliant, um, but that might be more convincing than heaps of graphs and data points and, you know, any types of, prioritization scoring or any of any of that nature like just take them through the actual pain show them the experience and and i think so for me if i were to recommend one thing is really flex your muscle when it comes to how to convince and you know think of your own life how do you convince your you know your partner or your kids uh, if you have um to do stuff <laughs> and it's not just with data 
as far at least not with my kids. I don't know. It's like I, I can't convince them just with data. So um, so for sure, try to flex your muscle in that sense. Um, Joe, yeah. any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, Herb Keller, who was one of the founders, I think he was the original CEO of Southwest, that's what he was known for. That's why people loved working for Southwest because Herb would take the time to spend with the baggage handlers, with the flight attendants, with the people that are handling the scheduling system. And so, uh, you know, as they grew, that leadership grew further and further away from their internal customers. So I really love, you know, you, you don't really know someone until you spend a day walking in their shoes, right? Eli, it's from the, the greatest, one of the greatest books of all time, To Kill a Mockingbird. It's yeah. a quote that's, that's, you know, will live on forever. And I think it, it, it's, it holds true in this case. No, I, I, absolutely. And I think one, one other thing coming to make about this is that um, um, it, it, the internal customer case is not just for like companies as big as Southwest. Like this is in all, I, I see that in all sides of companies. And I, I really think that's like the, for everybody on the audience, I think this is something that I'm sure everybody feels the, like a lot of people feel the pain in your company as well. Even if you're like a 50 people or 100 people company, there's always an internal customer that can benefit from product. And, and so make sure that you are to Joe's point, make sure that you're in their shoes, make sure that you feel their pain. And then I think once you do, as a product manager, then you, you might have more empathy and you might think, you know, longer and harder when you do your prioritization, you know, whether you want to do um, just progression, just this, or, or you want to mix it up and you know, add some stuff that will help alleviate some of the pains inside the company. And it, it really is a, a balance, right? So it's not, it's not an easy balance to, to, to hit, um, but it is a balance uh, that you need to hit in that sense. But a couple of questions come in as well around um, uh, user experience and user interface compared to, we've talked a lot about sort of that, that technical infrastructure type of debt, um, but how, how do you measure uh, the cost of a, of a poor UX that's maybe it costs an internal customer three extra clicks to do something when it could be done in one? And how do you measure the cost to a large organization like Southwest Airlines, even if you don't have a catastrophic failure because your employees are having to spend an extra 60 seconds to do a task, you're paying them for that 60 seconds. And how do you, how do you quantify how that adds up over time? Eli, I'll let you take this one and I can add on to it. Yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead. I'll, I'll go ahead if you don't. If, uh... No, no, go ahead. You... Ah, okay, so, so I, I think in terms of, uh, in, in terms of, I mean, again, to kind of echoes also Joe's point, we're in, a, we're in an era now that profitability makes, makes a lot of difference, right? So we're in an era now that, you know, making sure that the bottom line is, uh, is important. And so actually doing some groundwork of quantifying how long does it take to do a task and then doing the multiple, that's actually where data can actually be very beneficial, right? So actually doing, you know, if I have whatever, 100 sales like uh, support representatives, who are doing something that can take them a minute and it's taking them 10 minutes. And it's because I haven't invested in, in internal, in my, in my internal customer, then that's a very easily quantifiable kind of thing to bring, to bring, to bring up and say like, Hey, I think I can find a solution for this. That would really save us a lot of time and hassle. And by the way, don't forget also, and that's one of the things that I'm sure Southwest is now learning or learn uh, the hard way. It also prevents churn. Like from like actually like you know like employee churn. Eventually, eventually, if your uh, internal customers, as in the employees of the company, are using archaic, painful tools on their day to day life, you know, to just to do their job, and I can think of many jobs that <laughs> have those tools. Um, at, at some point, they might say, "Well, you know what? I I don't want to do this anymore. This is like too painful for." So, and and that 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 cost is also massive for the company as well. So, I would really take those two points in terms of like you know kind of like time saved and then quantify also the risk of churn and kind of like disgruntlement within those teams that we use systems that are that are old and, and try to quantify that into a, into a number that you can put in front of in front of people right so i think that's really the that's really where actually data kind of like pops up and like becomes like a really powerful tool for for convincing people There was a question in here. I was kind of, as, as Eli was going through that, there's a question here about personas. I want to go back to that one. Sure. Uh, and the question was, you know, I thought personas are only for your external customers. And actually, you know, what we stress is, you know, personas can come in many different shapes and sizes. They can be your 
externally your person that's paying for your service or your good. But personas can also be for the buyer, the person that's making the decision. Personas are also for your internal customers. So they may not have to be as elaborate. You know, when we talk about building personas in our in our workshops and in our training, you know, we have like a nice play template with a picture and a quote. But at the end of the day, you know, when we when we emphasize, you know, getting to know your customers, it's really what are their goals and motivations and what are their pain points? They're, we're human, right? And so getting a good understanding of what those pain points and those goals and motivations are. I even, you know, you don't have to publish it like you would publish an external persona, but heck, I've done personas on the side for my stakeholders so that I know what are their hot buttons. I think Eli had even mentioned this uh, earlier in the, in, the, in the discussion. There's nothing wrong with that. They can be for anyone that's getting value from the product or service you're providing to them. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I, I couldn't, couldn't agree more, Joe. I mean, persona is definitely not just for the end user of, of a system or, or, or external customers. I, absolutely an amazing, really amazing, amazingly powerful tool for product managers to just like, and, and the extended teams that they're working with to understand who are you building it for? What's the value that they're supposed to get from it? What are their pain points? You know, all these things are critical for building products. And it's, it's a very powerful tool, which is in many cases neglected, right? So, and we know that, you know, Joe, that's like one of the things that we, we, we see a lot in companies that they just like skip it, you know, and they just like, I know the user, I know the persona, you know, and like, I, I get it. And, and, and really that's the piece within product management of strategy that is so critical, so, so critical. And you don't have to, it's not like, and by the way, it isn't like a piece you do like on, a, on a, every week, you know, you're going to update your personas on a, on a daily basis or on a weekly basis, but it is critical to do it and to make sure that you cover uh, everything, everything around that so that you have yeah. it. And that when you're building things, you, you're always going to revisit, you can revisit it and you can train people to revisit it so that you can yeah. use it. Absolutely. Well, and, and to that point, you know, we, you know, as product leaders, we represent the voice to the user, you know, the voice of the user to your organization. And. So what we have to do is we build that persona or that prototype persona, and then we go back and we validate it. You know, we go and we talk to them. We walk in their shoes for a day or two. You know, we do customer visits, do internal visits, go visit with your accounting team, your legal team, your sales team. I always, uh, in my previous organization, I would shadow our sales team. You know, there's always conflict with sales. For whatever reason, there's conflict with sales. And, you know, at the end of the day, you get a lot of value just, just shadow them, see what drives them, see what they're getting tripped up on and see if you can make their life a little bit easier. So you, you build that persona, but then you have to go back and validate and update it through those voice of customer techniques that we talk a lot about in our, in our workshops and in our training. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say, and I, I think I mentioned this in the, in the previous webinar, one of my recommendations, and it's not always possible, but if possible, not just shadow, do actually yeah, absolutely do, do their job do their, like go like, you know if you're like let's take the example of sales because it's a very easy one if you're i think a lot of product managers they come to client meetings but when they come as the product manager as i always like to say nobody wants to insult the guy who built the feature by saying to his face you know this is a terrible feature like i think this is horrible it's very rare that humans would say that to a product manager sit you know Put yourself in a position of somebody else, have a soda, soda, a soda personality just for a couple of hours, and then try and try to see how people react to your, to your, to your uh, speech. Then really powerful, really, I believe, really, really powerful uh, thing to do for, for product managers and, and something that's not commonly used, at least from what I've seen. Here we got time for what, a couple of questions, Robin? Yeah, so we've had uh, several several good ones come here. Let's see, um, really really great engagement in in chat. By the way, this is good lively conversations happening uh, and folks sharing tips with each other, which I love to see. Um, and uh, I, a good question here are um, uh, how good UX is about how easy it is for a user to understand something, which is a combination of right good design and consistency. So how do you measure how well a user 
understands and comprehends the product. Um, you know, how, what can you observe that would, that would help you with that? Or, or if you have access to them, what, what would you ask them, you know, when it comes to the usability of the product? I mean, there are different techniques for this, right? I'll, I'll start off with this one that you led. You know, there, when I was uh, in online publishing, you know, when we were releasing a new capability or feature, we would use user testing and we would ask them to complete a given task and we'd watch them. We'd record their mouse and see how long it would take for them to complete a given task. So it could be as, something as simple as that. Uh, you know, that's more qualitative, uh, but then there's also MPS scores. You know, are they referring you to their friends? Are they writing reviews about your product in Google reviews? Or if you're a restaurant or you provide a service in Yelp or any other, any, any other way to get that feedback, those are usually indications of satisfaction and, and happiness with, with your product. I don't know if Eli, do you want to add to that? Yeah, well, I, I'm, I was about to say, I mean, we're kind of like five minutes to ending and to start like, the, I mean, <laughs> happy to talk about, I'm, <laughs> happy to open up the conversation as to how you do good ux uh, testing and 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 but it's like it's it's probably not gonna we're not gonna conclude it in 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 the last five minutes but very valid question i would say you know in the context of the internal customer um there is a little bit of the art of good enough um and, and i think that's where you know there's there's a little bit of which is by the way i i think is kind of uh, interesting on its own when you have external, when you are building for external customers, and UX, of course, uh, to your point, Joe, is, is harder to measure. And then you have to do either qualitative or quantitative uh, measurements, you know, either by uh, measuring events and tele telemetry of the product, or by qualitative, like you know, watching recordings or even uh, interviewing in usability testing, etc. Um, uh, with the internal customers, um, measuring UX in many cases is really like it would be much more. I would say probably much much more qualitative than quantitative. Um, with a lot of like, um, you know, is, is there noise? And that's really the benefit of like having an internal customer because it's in your organization. So you can kind of like, you know, talk to the leadership and talk to the people in, you know, at the, in your company and just ask, hey, if this, is this process painful for you guys? Tell me, tell me more. And then trust me, <laughs> because it relates to the, their life and to their day-to-day -day job, <laughs> they will share as, as much as you want and more about the pains uh, from a UX or you know usability perspective about your internal products. So I, I would say actually, funnily enough, in the case of internal customers and external customers, like usability or UX is very differently measured um, and, and actually easier. Fun, again, in the context of Southwest, it's, it, 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 sounds, it sounds kind of funny, but it's much easier to know. And Joe, I think you mentioned it earlier, everybody knew, nobody was surprised when those systems collapsed and eventually they moved into like, you know, actually phone booking of like staff, no, very few people internally were very surprised about it because they knew the system was not, you know, up to scratch, both from a technical debt perspective and, and from a usability perspective. So it was kind of like, you just have to talk to people rather than like do a massive complicated usability testing kind of thing. All right. Well, we are coming up to the top of the hour, so I would like us to start to wrap things up here and uh, wanted to quickly mention our LinkedIn uh, group. Uh, we did have a, a little bit of technical difficulties, folks. Uh, folks, thank you for bearing with us uh, through this webinar today. Um, but we also do have an offer for everyone uh, because of that. Um, as an appreciation, we're offering an exclusive discount on courses and self-studies to any of our attendees uh, to take 25% off. Use the coupon code in the chat, grounded25, on any of 280 Group's uh, courses to, uh, to dive in more, right? We talk a lot about user experience and how to allocate technical debt and so forth. So um, join our LinkedIn community to keep continue the conversation. Like I said, I saw a lot of great conversation happening in the chat um, and look forward to seeing it uh, continue there. Any closing thoughts, Elad or Joe? Joe? I, I just think it goes back to um, empathy. You know, empathy with your users, your internal users, and empathy for your tech leads, your engineers, and understanding, you know, they're trying to help you build and innovate and we have to empathize and understand that in order to get there, we have to we have to make investment in our time. 
and that's in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the form of tech debt. So uh, next time you see your tech engineer, give that individual a hug and say, thank you. Because without them, you, you, you aren't successful in, in your job. <laughs> I can't top that, Joe. I can't. <laughs> Hugging people is like, you know, that's like, that's a, a good hug, Eli. A virtual, virtual, I know, I hug. know. We're, we're living a ver it's all good. I'm just saying it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good karma ending for this. So I, 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 think, that's, I think that's good for, for me as well. Um, so cool. Thank you, guys. Thanks. All right. Thanks, thanks everybody. And thanks a lot thanks for, everyone. and thanks Robin for, for uh, managing a lot of this uh, very hectic and cool uh, session. So, oh yes, we did have several, uh, several comments about uh, how we could, we could talk, we could do a whole session on, on user experience in, uh, in particularly in webinar clients. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Next, so. next one. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, appreciate everyone bearing with us. And, and again, great conversation. Um, really enjoyed this session. Let's go forth and uh, see if we can be some change makers and, and think about uh, tech debt and internal customers. So, Thanks, all right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.